we are, and off we go. Uh, the open public meeting. What? Oh, look at that. That's it. Thank you, Ryan, CHS grad. So I take that all back, and that was all for stalling, and it worked. Um, just a quick housekeeping. The open public meeting statement, in accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meeting Act, Chapter 231, PL 1975 announcement, I wish to announce that the New Jersey Open Public Meeting Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the school district of the Chatham's Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, place thereof posted in the board administrative offices sent to the clerks of the Chatham Borough, the Chatham Township, the Library of the Chathams, the Chatham Courier, the Daily Record, the Star Ledger, and the TAP. Mr. DeQuilla, would you mind taking attendance? Sure. Ms. Ciccarelli. Here. Ms. Clark. Here. Mr. Del Sandro. Here. <clears throat> Mr. Gilfillan. Here. Ms. Kenny. Here. Ms. Ross. Here. Mr. Ryan. Here. Mr. Smith. Here. And Ms. Weber. Here. Nine president of the county. Wow. Gang's all here. Welcome back. Excellent. If you're able to, um, please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is today over by Peter. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag. flag. United States, United States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. And again, I apologize for the delay and the technical difficulties. So um, for those that were waiting for the live feed at home, we apologize. So that was my board opening comment. I'm done with that. So right over to you, Dr. Lasusa, for update and the school start times and also maybe um, talk about the news that we heard today regarding Governor Murphy's announcement. Yes, thank you, Ms. Weber. So the first item on my agenda is just to congratulate all of the people, students, staff, crew um, involved in the drama, the, the musical drama at Lafayette this past weekend, as well as the middle school. Uh, they did an absolutely terrific job uh, by all accounts. It was our first ever drama production at Lafayette. and. Um, they just hit it out of the park from what I understand and it was the first uh, drama with a full audience and you know the whole nine yards over at the middle school since we renovated the auditorium so uh, also you know high marks and high praise all around for that production so a special shout out to everyone involved. Uh, second item as you uh, mentioned is that I woke up this morning to news that Governor Murphy would give a press conference lifting the mask uh, order I watched the press conference in its entirety at 1 o'clock today, uh, and the long and short of it is that uh, effective March 7th, uh, masks will no longer be required in schools or daycares or preschools or childcare uh, centers and facilities in New Jersey. Uh, so <clears throat> um, based on prior discussions that we've had here dating all the way back to July of uh, last year before the uh, order was put in place, um, I don't think I'm talking out of term when I say I think it's the sentiment of the board that we would move to a mask optional environment in all buildings and all grade levels effective March 7th when the order expires. Um, unless you tell me otherwise this evening, we will queue up for the policy committee meeting we have scheduled this Wednesday night. Uh, any policy related to masking that we currently have on the books and we will update it to reflect uh, optionality at all levels and then that will put us in a position where three weeks from today uh, we have our next meeting the 28th of February we would do the probably the first second reading and adoption so that we're all in order uh, come March 7th uh, and if we proceed down that road it would effectively mean that we have 14 school days left uh, where students are required to wear masks because we do have the schools closed the final week of February. Uh, so really it's this week and next before we get to that week. And then um, when we return, we're, it's February 28th and we'll, we'll knock out that week quickly and we'll be at March 7th before we know it. If you want to discuss it or ask any questions, certainly. No, you just you're correct that in July we all did say that um, if the executive order were lifted, we would let it go mask optional. Um, some folks want to know, well, like, why aren't you just doing it today? You know, one, the executive order is still in effect and the, the consequences are still in effect. But for some folks, and Mike probably gets more emails than I do, but 
For some folks, this is terrifying. For some of our students, it's terrifying to remove the mask, but we have to move on. But the four weeks isn't going to be that detrimental to those that have been wearing them for two years, but those four weeks might be necessary for some of our students to kind of get used to it. And more importantly, those four weeks give parents who otherwise had chosen not to vaccinate their children, those four weeks now gives them an opportunity, if they choose, to then vaccinate. So then it gives them a four weeks to make a, make a choice there and maybe make some adjustments and help their students, uh, you know, get used to the idea that they're going to be going into school now with probably the majority of kids unmasked. Um, again, it's mask optional. Students and teachers and whoever wants to wear a mask, you know, certainly feel free to, but um, we're, we're not going to step, I, I don't, I mean, unless the board directs me otherwise, we're not going to say, you know what, rules be damned and take the mask off tomorrow. We're going to adhere to the executive order. March 7th, we'll then make masks optional. Um, so I just wanted to add, somebody sent me an email right before we came to the meeting, but I'm sure they're not the only ones saying, why aren't you taking masks off? So those, that's the rationale that we're not going to go against the executive order. Oh, could you turn on Bradley's mic, please? I think, hello. I think it's also important just to reiterate what you said, that it, it requires a policy change that has to be adopted first, second reading, and, and, and adopted by the board, which will happen what did you say, three weeks from today? Mm -hmm. Right, so that's a process we have to get through. We can't just make that change without that process. And it takes time. Yeah, I think when, you, when I was thinking of it, like today's February 7th, March 7th, that's a count, you know, it's a month. But 14 days sounds, with the break, we can do this in 14 days, we've made it this far. And, you know, I think most of our kids will look forward to March 7th and be able to make a choice with their families, and those who don't, we support them as well, and I think we'll get to a place, but 14 days, we can do this. Excellent. Any other thoughts? I'll be happy to take my mask off, just saying. <laughs> um, excellent, okay, uh, Dr. Lususa, you had some additional items? Yes, so the other item is just a brief presentation. It's a follow-up from the December uh, meeting we had when I started talking about school start times, and um, it'll be 10 minutes long probably at most, and if you wanna go sit in the okay, seats, very then good. we can. Okay, oh, uh, PowerPoint, not just yes. a, okay. Yep. And Nick I'll, Nick, I'll kind of stand so you can get, instead of splitting the shots. Um, yeah, so back on December 10th or whatever date it was, um, I talked a little bit about school start times. And since then, I have followed up with uh, our uh, leadership uh, of the PTO as well as leadership of our teachers association, uh, some of our school administrators. So I'm just going to kind of move through more quickly or more swiftly what I talked about last time, hopefully streamline it a bit so everyone is clear about what the proposal is and uh, move the ball down the field a little bit further. And I'll start by just by saying uh, at the end of last meeting or the December meeting when we were having kind of a back and forth with the board, um, I made a comment uh, and the comment was along the lines that I've been in public education for 25 years now actually started January of 1997 in Philadelphia. And uh, I believe that the greatest achievement of my career would be to push back the start time of our high school day uh, to reflect the physiology and biology of teenage kids and what's in their best interest and what's best for them. It will be the biggest achievement of my career to this point if we make this happen, and it will be the biggest achievement if I do another 25 years in the business. So I'm gonna start with five facts to summarize and then a three-part proposal. So fact number one is just that our students in Chatham are not sleeping enough. And I'm talking about our adolescent students, our students in grades six through 12. Um, and I'm not saying that there aren't a variety of uh, contributing factors to lack of sleep. We know that social media or cell phones or video gaming 
or scheduling uh, students for all kinds of activities after school, all of that could contribute to not sleeping enough. Uh, but we know definitively that they are not sleeping enough because of the surveying that we've been doing for the past five or six years. Uh, and we know what the recommendations are for teenagers uh, to get them the, the proper amount of sleep, which is a minimum of eight hours. Some organizations involved with pediatric health recommend actually more than that. Uh, but at a minimum, they need eight hours. Fact number two uh, is that a lack of sleep is associated with all sorts of outcomes that we don't want for our kids. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that sleep is the only contributing factor to some of these bullets that we see up here on the screen. Um, but when you're tired, your decision making is not as good. Your mental acuity is not as good. Uh, and your mental and emotional state uh, is not as good. So we know that lack of sleep is associated with consequences and outcomes that we don't want for our children. Fact number three that we all know, and this isn't just kids we're talking about, it's adults too, but the pandemic has exacerbated uh, concerns that we have over mental health, as well as substance use and other uh, worrisome behaviors. Uh, so I have this as a fact up here just because I think if there was ever a time where we should try to be doing everything we can to support the mental health and well-being of students, it's now. Coming out of the pandemic, uh, when we know that we're dealing societally with more negative uh, outcomes than we've seen pre-COVID-19. Uh, Fact number four is that when schools, high schools in particular, push back their start times, kids sleep more. So I've got a red statement here, uh, which is those folks who say, well, if you, if you start the day an hour later, kids just stay up an hour later and they don't sleep anymore, that's nonsense. That's not true. We know that from study after study across the country. Uh, when schools push their times back, high schools I'm talking about, students go to bed about the same time and they get up later. They might not get up 60 minutes later, if the start time was moved back 60 minutes, they might give themselves 10 or 15 minutes more in the morning so that they can eat breakfast or reduce some of the uh, anxiety and, and freneticism uh, that is associated with morning routines, but kids do sleep more. And we know that sleep, unlike lack of sleep being correlated or associated with negative outcomes, uh, being well rested is associated with a lot of positive outcomes that we would want to see for our children. And they include academic outcomes that are better, lower rates of attendance, but also uh, mental health and emotional uh, uh, well-being metrics that we would uh, like to see improved, like lower rates of depression and anxiety. So I showed these last time, but I'll just do three really quickly. The yellow bar is 20, uh, 2021, the blue bar is 2016. So you can see that Essentially, uh, and I don't have a laser, I don't think, on this thing. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, doesn't work too well. Uh, but basically, our students are reporting that they're sleeping less over the years. So it's not static. Actually, every couple of years when we survey kids, what we've been seeing the last three surveys is that uh, the amount they're sleeping is decreasing uh, for whatever reason. The high school is where the problem is most acute. Uh, we have, if you tally these up, about 45% of our high schoolers reporting that they sleep six hours or less on a, on a nightly basis during the school week. Um, so although we have some concerns at the middle school, it's really the high school where the, the concerns are concentrated. And that's reflected in, in this particular chart. So the blue bars are uh, the percentage of students who are reporting getting eight or more hours of sleep. And you can see that in grades six and seven, on the far left of the, ch of the chart, the majority of our sixth and seventh graders are getting adequate sleep, the majority. It drops off pretty precipitously in eighth grade, which is probably associated with the onset of adolescence and puberty and other things that kids are going through. And then it just keeps on falling uh, right through grade 12. And you can see only about 15% of our students in grades 11 and 12, when the college application process is heating up, 
Uh, only about 15% are reporting getting eight hours of sleep. And conversely, almost 50% on average, 11th and 12th grade, are reporting getting six or fewer hours of sleep. So, uh, the proposal um, that tries to reflect everything that I just uh, showed on the screen is to change the time that Chatham High School would start its day from 7.40, which is the current start time, to 8.20. Push back Chatham High School start by 40 minutes. Part two of the proposal is in addition to that, make two fairly minor adjustments inside the school day. And the first adjustment would be to take each academic period, there are six periods in our high school day, and change their length from 57 minutes to 55, and take our lunch, which right now is 56 minutes long, and make it 54 minutes. Some of you might wonder, why don't we reduce it further than 54 minutes? The reason we need the 54 minutes is that we run our science labs out of lunch, and the science labs right now are 27 minutes in length. They're basically 27 plus 57. We would keep them at 27 and make them 27 plus 55 so that we have no impact to our science teachers' ability to prepare for their labs and engage students in lab acti activities. So the schedule, and again, we'll post this online. It's been posted online since December, but we'll put it up there again. The schedule would look something like this. This is a draft. We may have to make some uh, you know, minor uh, changes around the edges, but it would look something like this. And you can see the notes in the middle. Just note that the period length moves from 57 to 55, uh, but lunch is, uh, rather labs during lunch are unchanged. The day would end at 3 p.m. if we uh, were to implement all those changes. The third part of the proposal is that in order to enable our busing uh, tiering to work, we would take our K through five schools and we'd start the day 15 minutes or 20 minutes, depending on the building you're talking about, later. So we would move uh, Lafayette from 840 to 855 and we'd move the three K three schools uh, also to 855. Uh, this would require us to provide a, an option for parents, which we have confirmed we can do through the work family connection, so that if parents need to drop their children off uh, at school before the day begins, because this 20 minutes would be a hardship for them, work family connection would be able to accommodate them, and work family connection has been a great partner and a very reasonable one. Uh, in terms of the, the fees that they charge for uh, supervising kids. So that's it. They, that's really the proposal in a nutshell. The um, addendum would just be that while we're doing this, we can take an opportunity to make a couple of improvements at the middle school inside the schedule. Wouldn't really change the start time of the CMS day, but we would align it to the high school schedule a little bit better and we would um, massage the periods and the rotations so that there's no more drop in, in classes at the middle school. Right now, every class drops once every eight days. We would do away with that, move to a four-day rotation where every single class meets every single day. And in my view, these changes overall, looking at the 3,700 plus kids in the district as they advance K through 12 would be a pretty significant improvement in their overall school experience by the time uh, they make their way through. Uh, so I'm presenting again today, and even though you've seen a lot of this already, um, because some of the feedback that I've gotten from the administrators and the teachers and the parents on the PTO is that um, the sooner we can kind of announce that this is our intention, the better it will be for folks to start planning, the better it will be to try to work through any of the issues that we need to work through to make a smooth transition, excuse me. Um, and of course, we'll have to confirm some things or make some modifications to how we supervise kids in the morning, um, deal with some logistics and workday issues, and the Teachers Association and I are committed to doing that. Uh, and then naturally, we'd have to inform parents so that they know what to expect and the more months lead time we give parents before the start of school next year, the better it would probably be for them. Um, and that's it. <laughs> that's it in a nutshell. I'm happy if, if you all come back on stage. We can, I can answer any questions if I can.
And thank you for indulging me a second time. That's interesting. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> I appreciate that. I know we want to talk about this pretty much at every meeting. Um, just real quick, you pretty much had me at the low. I know you've been talking about this for the last 10 years. I've probably been listening to you for the last six, maybe listening to you more seriously for the last three. So it's not like you just woke up one day and thought, gosh, let's do this. I know this has been a goal of yours for a, close to a decade. Um, the fact that it equates to all positive and we can remove negative, you know, I say full steam ahead, let's try and make that happen. I'm curious how long in your next steps you have a few things in your critical path. How much time do you need to iron out some of those items and when can we anticipate, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, when can we anticipate being able to alert parents to the direction that we want to move? March meeting, you know, I April think that meeting. March would be reasonable, I think. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Man. Sorry, I got something stuck in my throat. Nick, can you turn on Matt? Hello? Oh. Yeah, just start talking. Um, here's my question on this. The, can we do an analysis and look at, in essence, um, child stress in terms of their curricular level to the amount of sleep that they're getting? Because, and can we do an analysis whereby we try to teach our kids that they don't need 19 APs to go to college, that they need a certain number is enough in order for them to compete effectively at the college level. So I would be more worried and interested in understanding of, of our, our kids overstressing themselves, over, overdoing it in terms of what the difficulty of their curriculum is with this belief or intent that this is the only way it is to get into college, which is, I think as we're finding is lunacy, right? We don't need, you don't need five APs junior and senior year to go to college, you just don't. And I think we should, if we're going to do this, do it as an all-encompassing mental health stress analysis and try to guide parents and kids that the pressures that they're putting themselves under because they believe it's the correct path to go to college is, is, is wrong. And I think we need to get feedback from colleges, all different levels, and say, you know, what do you look for and expect from our kids of Chatham to be eligible and to be competitive for admittance into your school. And if they say six APs is enough, then we need to tell our kids they don't need to take five as a senior. They can take two as a, you know, three as a junior and three as a senior. So look at it from an all-encompassing standpoint. It's insane what these kids put themselves under for what might be a waste of time. Not so much a waste of time, but just unnecessary reasons. So if you could look into that, I think that would be an interesting um, kind of like add-on to what you're trying to achieve here which is you know, an overall development and, and an improvement of, of mental health and reduction of stress. And I, just, I think it's completely unfair what our kids go through these days in terms of what they think they need to do. It's just insane. And we shouldn't, if we can guide them against that and let them know it's okay, you don't need 25 APs, then I think we need to provide that analysis and provide that guidance to our kids and the parents. I, I agree, Matt, we can do more of that. We certainly have been doing that. If you remember Karen Leister and Lisa Latarulo's presentation earlier this year, we did ask questions to students about, you know, where does your stress come, what is the source of your stress, the greatest source of your stress? It frequently came from themselves, um, less so the school, and then a little more parents, but it was mostly each other. I mean, it was mostly the students themselves that are uh, imposing such pressure on themselves, and we've been trying to educate them in the fact that they don't need to be in all honors classes or all AP classes and carry a, a, a load that is greater than it needs to be. Um, but we can do more of that and double down and emphasize that better if we're taking a comprehensive approach to their overall you know, mental health and well-being as we go into next year. Is that me? Showing them, you know, what kids take in high school and where they went to school, and you show 
you know, what we call the high flyers, <clears throat> excuse me, that are taking, you know, five, six, seven, ten AP classes and the kids that maybe took none or one, and yet they all went to the same school. So I know you started that, and, mm -hmm. you know, to Matt's point, you know, the, the surveys keep saying that they're put, imposing the stress on themselves. So I think, we, like you said, we need to do more. We need to see what's going to move the needle, make a difference. Um, I know that you do a ton of presentations, and that's one of my favorite is the eighth grade presentation. I just don't know. We need to do maybe not more of the same, but something different to mm -hmm. get their attention. Um, I have a question. Am I on? I am. Um, just about, just to revisit the 10 minutes, so when you look at it, like a class, that if it's going down two minutes a day, so you're looking at 10 minutes a week. I, I just think we cannot create busy work for kids online. We cannot try to make those minutes up in ways that are not genuine and real valuable learning. So we do, we have learned to do things differently using our technology and different ways to learn. I am asking that we think really critically that we do not just assign work to kids to make up and try to stay on pace for whatever it is. We, we have to be creative in our teaching approaches to use our time wisely with our students in our classrooms. So um, that's my one request. The other one is I would think we need to be really, um, we need to be more specific about also the dismissal times for our elementary and, La and Lafayette. I saw there's a bump in the start times. What time will those schools be getting out? And we need to communicate that because those are the students that require, if they're not taking the bus, they need to be picked up. They require adult supervision. And we need to um, get that information out really timely and give plenty of time for planning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, on the, the first one, we, we certainly don't mm -hmm. want, you know, to just dump more stuff into Google Classroom mm -hmm. or Schoology. Um, we actually feel like we've, you know, we, we've been more efficient with time because we have so much there already so that the kids know before the day even begins half the time what the homework will be that night or what the assignment, you know, what the material is in class. Uh, so we've just, we've gained time by having such a much more robust set of resources online that I think we can overcome the two minutes or, or we can, mm -hmm. we don't need to try to make up for the two minutes a period by putting more work um, online. And in terms of the end of the day, I mean, I think that's probably uh, right now one of the bigger uh, concerns of the Teachers Association is just that if our elementary um, teachers are ending the day later, uh, they're required to stay a certain period of time after the school day ends and students leave. And if they have their own arrangements with mm -hmm. childcare and kids in other districts, young children in other districts, I'm saying, um, if they're delayed further in getting home or getting to their kids, then that kind of creates a domino effect. So those are the types of things where we would sit down and work through, and eventually that could end up requiring a sidebar agreement with the association or um, you know, just about how their time is allocated before or after the day. But we're pretty optimistic based on our preliminary discussions that we could do something that would be beneficial to everyone and um, help alleviate some of that concern. Michelle, you bring up a good point on the technology side, and I think, I think we need to stress and make parents and students aware of the catalog. The pandemic has been awful, but one thing it has provided us is we have a catalog of, of lessons that the, the teachers have provided and have online, so a kid can prepare ahead of time if they have a little... So they can almost make their time more beneficial when they get in, because they've already they watched the lesson, and they could come readied with their question and get the help that they need. Um, so I think that, and it also helps with independent learners who want to go ahead or want to re review something. So again, the pandemic was awful, but it certainly has provided leaps and bounds and efficiencies and the number of resources that we have. So there, you know, if a kid has a soccer match or a field hockey game, they can get ahead and do some asynchronous learning and then just use their time with the teacher more efficiently. Yeah, and on that front, Jill, what also helps us is that we still do have the, um, the independent student learning you know, alternative arrangement for students who participate in, in uh, interscholastic athletics. Right. So right now they can take advantage of not going to phys ed class if they are involved in an uh, interscholastic athletic activity 
so that just if they if they do have to be dismissed at the same time as they are now let's just say for an away game in in Sussex County uh, if they're dismissed at the same time when we change the schedule they'd miss more class um, but we have embedded in every day of theirs the ability to, to basically have a study hall instead of physical education um, and they have the catalog available to them so we think we can you know we really think we can reduce the overall impact to student athletes at least when you're talking about those kinds of things mm -hmm. and, and the transportation is not um, an issue transportation so transportation is always an issue yeah um, this proposal would be an improvement in the afternoon the afternoon especially early in the year the last several years we've had troubles because the elementary students are picked up uh, last they're brought home and if those buses are delayed because of the high school or middle school runs they end up being very late in the afternoon um, that's probably our greatest number of angry phone calls is in the you know first couple months of the year when buses are delayed this would create more space uh, in the afternoon overall and okay. it would probably help in that regard in the morning um, we have to work through uh, what the routes would look like with the middle school starting the day versus the high school right now the high school starts the day and the kids are dropped off who take the bus very very early like a, like 40 minutes before the day begins right um, that's easier to do with high school kids because you don't need as tight a level of supervision on them but with middle school kids you do that's one of the um, you know, challenges that might be a, a, a downside of this is, is having to flip the middle school students into the first rotation of the buses in the morning. Um, but we, again, the more lead time we have, the more notice we can give the bus company and the more massaging we can do to try to mitigate how much that might impact some of the routes. Okay. Tiered. Tiered. Right now, where they pick up high school first, mm -hmm. middle school second, and they have to get them all at the same time. Yeah. Well, no, they'd stay tiered, but we'd flip the order of the tiers. Gotcha. So they're triple tiered in the morning, and uh, they're triple and double tiered in the morning, and they're double tiered in the afternoon. Okay. That would remain the case. Okay. Excellent. And I think it screams volumes that, I mean, you've been in education for 25 years. You've been here for over a decade. The fact that you said this would be your greatest achievement screams volumes. You know, that, that, that it is that important to you to, to achieve this particular goal. That really says a lot, and uh, you know, I think we should move forward. Can you get back to us at the next? We, well, you may not have enough time. Our next meeting is in two weeks. Maybe you could just give us an update on some of those items that are in your critical path to sure. get to a March decision. Because sure. I think I think you're right. The more time we can give folks to plan, obviously, the better. Make arrangements in whatever direction. Although I would argue that high schoolers probably need more supervision than the younger kids, having uh -huh. had three of them. <laughs> One would argue the most dangerous thing is a high schooler left at home alone. And we also need to let the neighbors around the schools know to, you know, it impacts them as well. If they don't have kids in the school, there's going to be different traffic patterns, there's going to be different hot times, and they are entitled to that information sooner than later. Does it impact the crossing guards? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And you've already worked you're in contact with the two chiefs regardless. I haven't been in touch with the police yet um, okay so maybe but we, add, we, we would do that okay just maybe add that to um, to your checklist that you've worked that out with the crossing guards as well <clears throat> excellent does anybody else have any additional questions for oh sorry Susan have there been any other um, or do you know how many other districts in New Jersey have moved their start times and if so have there been any studies on the impact of you know academics or just overall mental health at the high school level? I know that Princeton uh, was one of the first high-profile districts that, that did this. Um, it was a little easier for them, I think. I've, I've seen a presentation uh, that they gave because they didn't have transportation, or at least their middle school and high school were located in such a way that all the students walked. Um, their follow-up surveys did um, indicate that students felt better and better rested. Um, I don't think they started at 8.20, but I can't remember what time it was, but it was after 8 o'clock. Milburn made a change last year. Um, I don't know if they have data yet on how well it's working, but they, they made a change. Tenafly has a later start time, if I 
I'm not mistaken. And then there are a couple of other districts around that just have always been later. Uh, some of the regional high school districts like Morris Knowles and Morris Hills and Freehold Regional, they, they split their bus schedules. So they tier their buses. So they have some school, schools that start at 730 and others at 820. And one of the reasons we know that we can, we feel confident we can work through some of the athletics is that there are other high schools that have been doing this for uh, a number of years. Do you think that's going to be the biggest pushback from parents is the athletics and it being dark in the winter, or, you know, just getting to sports seems to be, you know, a, a pretty big deal in Chatham. So I'm just wondering if that's going to be the main concern. Yeah, I think that that's often cited as one of the limiting factors. Um, I, I don't know. How, I, I think... I think that a lot of high school athletes right now are accustomed to being dismissed early already. They, they, there are some times where we have games scheduled for 2 p.m. We are in an athletic conference now that goes up to Su Sussex County and Western Morris. So I think there's already a comfort level with being dismissed. Because the times of the day would be, would be later, uh, students theoretically would miss more class. But we've talked about, I've talked with our athletic director, you know, Something as simple as we have a 20, we would have a 25 minute differential. We end at 235 now, we would end at three if we were to go forward with this. 25 minutes is what we would quote unquote need to make up. There are some events that we could just instead of begin them at four o'clock, begin them at 415. And then we've got the majority of the time captured back already. There are little things we can do like, um, and I know I'm getting into the weeds here, but let's just say our custom is to dismiss students before the last block of the day, which is at 1.35. Um, it might be that that might be a nice custom and it might be easy to remember. I don't go to my last period of the day. I just go to the locker room or I catch the bus or whatever. Um, but we might want to be more uh, surgical and say, okay, when it's September and there's still a lot of light out, you don't need to be dismissed at 135. You need to be dismissed at 152 or 155. 152 might be too greedy here. Um, but then we get into October, that bumps down to 145, and it's not until November that you really have to get out at 135. So we, we feel like there are little adjustments we can make to reduce the impact on the student athletes. On the flip side, I think that it's going to help, well, it helps manage your time, or you have to figure out how to manage your time, which you're going to have to do in college anyway, so it's a skill, and especially if you're a student athlete and you're going to play sports in college, that, you know, so, thanks. Sarah. Chris, we can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, spring is, uh, Mr. Del Sandro was just saying spring is less of an issue because there's more light. In the beginning of the spring in March, if, we, if we're doing scrimmages, um, and then maybe in the first parts of April, uh, some of our fields, we, we run the, the varsity contest at four o'clock and then the JV plays right after that. So that's where we run into issues where we, we could run out of light. But again, by May, that pretty much is, is not an issue anymore. Um, and we'd have to make, you know, we'd have to try to figure out how to reduce the overall uh, impact that that would have. We can't eliminate it completely. I, you know, there are going to, student athletes may have to miss more class but they all benefit on the front end of getting more sleep, um, and then we would try to reduce the amount of class that they, that they might miss. And I'm sure it would be imperfect. You know, the first year we would be trying to figure out how to do it better and better, and hopefully by the second year or third year we would, we, we would get some things down and learn some things that enable it to happen more efficiently. Work they need to get done and make up as well. They're, they're, they're very diligent, so they, they know what they need to do. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so more next next meeting on that. Uh, was that it, Dr. Lususa, on the superintendent's report? That's it for me. Okay, very good. Uh, Peter, over to you con for construction. Sure, just a, uh, a brief report. The maintenance department has been diligently dealing with uh, some heating uh, issues at various schools, and they're doing their best uh, to get the parts they need and uh, utilize outside contractors to solve them all as quickly as possible. I would just like to acknowledge the efforts of the maintenance staff and the custodial staff uh, over the last two snowstorms that they should be commended for their efforts in getting the district, uh, all the district property cleaned and ready for school so that everybody can come uh, in a, and be here and be safe. That's all I have unless there's any questions. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, they always do a fantastic job. Um, uh, Peter, just a quick question. On the, you're still on schedule to do the work at the middle school on the roof? 
We are still on schedule. The no supply chain issues. They're not going to come well, back and say we can't get something. The, the biggest the biggest concern I have is that the contractor received all of the materials in August, that he keeps them safeguarded in storage until June, and they don't get allotted elsewhere. But I've been told, and you know, that they swear that it's earmarked. The warehouse is big enough to hide them, and we should be all set to go. Okay. Well, tell him we hide our money too, and we'll pay him. <laughs> I haven't paid. I haven't paid him a dime. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Very good. Just if you can, just keep reminding him that I, I just I don't will. want to lose another, another year on no. that project. Thank you. Any questions for Peter on, any of those items? No. Nope. Okay. Over to committee reports. Um, personnel, Ms. Ciccarelli. Uh, yes, we met briefly on um, January nineteenth, and we discussed the selection process for the supervisor of mathematics. Um, also a confidential personnel matter. We also talked about uh, recruitment, staffing, and retention, and the structure of substitutes maximum hours. And we are scheduled to meet again on March 9th. Great, thank you. Any questions for Ann? No. Ms. Clark, um, take over for curriculum now. Curriculum met on January 24th. We had two pre presentations. One was from the assistant principal at Chatham High School, Doug Walker, on the review of the graduates of 2021. Um, Mr. Walker will be presenting to the full board on at Mar it's in March or, or the 28th, on February 28th. Um, and we just got to see kind of a preview as to what changes have been made at the guidance level in terms of um, putting in some vocational options. Um, opening and adjusting timelines um, for especially our rising seniors to allow for counseling sessions to occur over the summer to kind of get a jump start on the application process for those who are interested in making um, counselors available for students at that time. Um, in addition, um, Steve Mayer, social studies supervisor, um, just gave an update on the uh, K to five level social studies program and the renewal of the TCI um, curriculum program, which is Teacher Curriculum Institute, which is a, it's kind of like a hybrid um, curriculum program, which offers, um, it gives online resources in addition to a student workbook. What is nice about this um, versus having a textbook is when we buy a textbook, we make an investment in the book and we own the book and then we're, for as long as the life, you know, our, our curriculum review, we're kind of stuck with the book. With this particular program, it's more dynamic where they update the materials to, you know, include more current events, to have more um, up-to-date materials annually. So um, it also is consistent. This is the program that has been used. Teachers are familiar with it. There's been a lot of positive feedback. Another pro to this is that there's articulation between grade levels. So teachers who may teach second grade has available access to a third grade or a first grade and to be able to, you know, reteach materials or pre-teach as needed. So um, it, that is something that's going to be adopted and pushed through, and um, that was it. So just look forward to um, Mr. Walker coming to our next meeting. Um, again, our graduates are continue to be impressive and represent Chatham well in all levels. And our next meeting is March 9th, I believe. Dr. Chase, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, thanks for speaking notes. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Gilfellan, Finance and Facilities? Uh, we have not met, we meet on Wednesday this week. Wednesday, excellent. And Mr. Ryan, Policy and Planning? Yeah, we are meeting uh, Wednesday this week, which is gonna be a jam-packed agenda. <laughs> it's going to be a marathon. Uh, we're going to review the mass policy, obviously. We're going to revise the policy for filling a vacancy um, due to a midterm uh, resignation of a board member. And I, we still have to do the transgender policy. Uh, we do have a transgender policy, but uh, it's not inclusive enough of other um, gender identities. So that's what the change is on that one. And like Along with oh, sorry. everything else that we have to do. And do all those have to go back to our attorney for review, or no, they can be written? Yeah, we can, we can write them. Okay. I know they get paid by the word, and sometimes it gets a little muddied when it comes back with a lot of therefores and their toes. 
Um, I'd rather it be concise and plain language. You know. Yeah. Great. That's Excellent. what we're shooting for. Thank you. Um, t -t 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 -t. Okay, great. So let us know how that goes. I know you're going to have a marathon meeting. You might want to schedule more time. Uh, for liaisons, um, Mike took away some of my thunder. Um, we saw Frozen Junior. A lot of Michelle and I were at Frozen Junior on Thursday. And on Saturday, I saw Willy Wonka. Both productions were amazing. The theaters were fantastic. The auditoriums were great. The sound was great. The kids are having a ball. I got a little nervous in one of the shows. I was sitting opposite, and I saw little kids working these crazy ropes back here. But man, they look like champs, and they look like pros. So the plays were fantastic. Thank you to everybody that worked so hard on those, but they came out great, and it was so much fun. I have the Candyman song in my head for days now, and I cannot get rid of it. Um, and I'm just going to step in on the borough um, liaison. Um, just to reiterate that we continue to work with the borough on any matters related to redevelopment. And in fact, we just heard um, from borough council member uh, Carolyn Dempsey, again, just reassuring us that you know, the council's working with the district and you know, we're all rowing in the same direction. We'll continue those meetings and meet again to continue the dialogue as things come up and change. So I uh, thank you to the borough council and to council member Dempsey again for you know, keeping the district in mind and working with us and making sure that Chatham stays you know, the best place in the world to live. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ann, did you want to add anything? No. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, any other items that folks wanted to cover on these fronts? Nope. Oh, Susan, go ahead. Um, CEF is, I uh, just wanted to mention that they're doing a Valentine's Day give, ba a give back with two local businesses. So if you mention CEF at either Woodland Bakery or Hickory Tree Pizza, when you're ordering a heart-shaped pizza or cookie decorating kits, um, CEF will get a percentage of the proceeds back to them. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, here we go. So I make a motion to move the minutes from the January 10th public and executive sessions. I'll second it. I think Matt was Matt the only one. Oh, Matt? That's the only one. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Duly noted. Minutes pass 801. Excellent. Great. So we have our first opportunity for public commentary. Hearing of the citizens during the public commentary section of the agenda is an opportunity for all members of the public to be heard about issues which are or are not topics scheduled for the current meeting. To help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, speakers will be asked to limit their comments to a reasonable length of time. And, and just as a reminder, this is the public's time to, you know, to, to make comments and, and address the board. It's not going to be a back and forth. We, I will take notes and I will try and answer what I can or Dr. Lasusa will answer what he can. Um, but just as a little experiment, just because I haven't done this in a while, I'm just going to take a minute so that everybody, we're just going to sit quietly for a few minutes just so you can see what three minutes feels like. Talk amongst yourselves.
that's what three minutes feels like. So I, I'm sure folks can get their points articulately across in three minutes. So if we can try and adhere to the time. I don't think folks realize how long three minutes is. And as I said, if I was at a stoplight for three minutes, I'd lose my mind. But um, so we have our first opportunity for public commentary. Um, there's one after the, we go through the regular agenda. So if you wouldn't mind um, just introducing yourself at the mic, that would be fantastic. Again, we won't interrupt, but I'll try and take notes and address items after we close the public session. Find everyone who speaks. There is a sign-up sheet to the left of the microphone. If you'd sign up either before or after you speak, it's much appreciated. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sharon Piscadlo, and I'm the co-president of the district cabinet. I'm really going to try to stay under that three minutes because that was exceptionally long. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to voice my support for the proposal to change school start times. Dr. Lasusa presented the idea of changing times to the district cabinet three years ago, and I remember feeling alarmed by the statistic that lack of sleep, increased depression, suicide ideation, and anxiety amongst children. I was also relieved and impressed that Dr. Lasusa had been researching this topic and comparing information about what other districts in various states were doing and had already gathered Chatham to see what was happening amongst our own children. Research is showing us that lack of sleep is leading to major mental health issues amongst our youth. When you hear the statistic that half of Chatham High School isn't getting enough sleep and the reverse effects this is having on our young minds, we have to open our eyes and we have to pay attention to this. We are so fortunate to have a superintendent and a board of education that is forward thinking and challenging the norm. We have a solution to a problem in front of us and in my opinion, we would be negligent as a district if we didn't at least try this option and see how it benefited our children. This is not a one size fits all solution and there is no doubt there are going to be challenges with scheduling for stem family members, for families and staff members. My family as well will have to figure out how to do new drop off times and pick up times. But if the solution will help decrease anxiety and depression and help students with their mental state at a time in their lives when it needs the most attention, then it's worth it. As co-president of the district cabinet, I know firsthand how dedicated, creative, and resourceful our PTO representatives can be. If this plan should go through, there are many people willing to join the effort to come up with additional plans that could ease the burden of start times for our younger children. In my experience, when people work collaboratively, greater outcomes prevail and better solutions come about. I know our district can take this initial plan and make it work for the betterment of all of our children. Member of, members of our PTO are committed to this, helping this, make this plan successful, myself included. We cannot deny the facts that were presented to us this evening and the well thought out solution already created. I wholeheartedly support this proposal for a change in start times and feel in a year from now, it will be something we look back on and feel proud our district implemented. Thank you, Dr. Lasusa, and to the Board of Education for being proactive and putting what's best for our children first. I truly appreciate it. Well, that couldn't have been any more perfect. You were exactly there at your three minutes. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Vanessa Yuri, resident of Chatham Borough. As I shared in December, we have three children attending Milton Avenue School. About two weeks ago, we learned from one of our children that the music classroom was being moved into the art room permanently. If you have ever been in the art room at Milton, it is already a relatively small space for students and supplies, and now also needs to accommodate space for music. For our second grader, Mr. Hasegawa's art class is literally one of the highlights of his experience at Milton. He uses his imagination and puts words and stories together, unlike in the classroom setting. Unfortunately, our kindergartners um, twins are only in half-day kindergarten, so they do not even get to experience music or art at all. We were able to piece together through attending PTO meetings and word of mouth that the music classroom is being used for an additional preschool classroom to be located at Milton, but to benefit the entire district. 
While there may be good reasons for this, none of this was communicated publicly or to the parents as far as I can tell. Also, our children still have limited access to the library and what books they do bring home are not necessarily aligned with their reading level or appropriate subject matter for their age. Anecdotally, we are also finding that many families, including ours, need to outsource in order for their children to keep up. Whether it be kindergarten enrichment, play-based learning, private tutors and reading specialists, writing classes, etc., almost 201, I don't know a family that hasn't needed some kind of extra. I have two main asks tonight in hopes to foster a more informed and transparent dialogue. The first ask is specific to Milton. I am asking the board to reconsider hiring a full-time library media specialist. At the presentation last year, Dr. Lususa stated that it was based on lower enrollment, but that does not speak to current enrollment and affording existing students increased access to the library, a more age and skill appropriate selection of books, and ideally another resource for the classroom teachers in reading and writing skills when resources and staff are already so limited. I would also like to understand why the music and art room have been combined to make room for an additional preschool classroom and staff when we don't yet have full day kindergarten for existing students. The students at Milton deserve to have the same access to the arts and resources as their peers at Washington Ave and SBS. Are the classrooms and staffing at the other elementary schools also being similarly compressed or just at Milton? Without current data, we can't properly evaluate that. Which brings me to my second broader ask. As a parent, I'm asking for more transparency from the board, its committees and the curriculum heads about decisions that affect the students in this district. In my mind, this would include current data about enrollment numbers, classroom size, agendas, curriculum resources, and future planning so that parents can make meaningful decisions about their children's education, where it's going, and where we may need to supplement. The question that comes to mind for me as a parent is, what is the strategic plan of this district, and how do I align my children's education with that in mind? In order to answer that question, I think we need more frequent and open dialogue, better access to current data and trends, a shared vision, and a constructive conversation on behalf of this community's most valuable assets, its children. Sorry, are you giving me a time signal? Yep. So, okay, time's up. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, if you could just glance up, Anne's doing them in increments just so that it's easier to pace. Good evening. My name is Betsy Long. I teach biology at Chatham High School. And this is Laura Noonan, and she teaches third grade at Southern Boulevard. We are co-presidents of the Chatham Education Association. With regard to the proposed later start change in the school day, we understand and agree that it is important from a mental health and academic standpoint to have the high school day start, early, uh, start later. We hope that CEA and administration will continue to collaborate to make changes to staff member responsibilities. For example, Monday meeting end times, end of the school day release time after student contact, professional development meetings, before, after school office hours, extracurriculars after school, like sports and theater, and home instruction. We would like to relieve the stresses of anticipating more changes to a year that seems like things are continually changing and out of everyone's control. We are confident that we can work collaborative, collaboratively to find solutions that will benefit everyone. Thank you for continuing to provide us with a seat at the table for discussions like this. Hello, good evening. My name is Megan Simone. I am a CHS special education teacher and CEA member. And I just wanted to share some recent CHS staff updates and announcements to recognize the impressive level of professionalism and dedication of my very, very talented colleagues. I'm gonna start with a fall sports recap. Our football team finished six and, with a six and three record and that earned them a playoff berth, the 11th in school history and the first since 2015. They were coached by Evan Picarello, a member of the physical education department. Girls tennis, coached by James Kai, member of the science department, finished their season Morris County champions as well as NJAC conference champions. I'm gonna say the word champions a lot in the next 30 seconds. Cross country, coached by Gianna Parlavecchio, a member of the physical education staff at CHS, 
Morris County champions. Field hockey, head coach Caitlin Layden here tonight, a member of Ch Chatham High School's special education department, Morris County champions. Girls soccer, coached by Gary Adair, a member of the phys physical education department. Morris County champions for the first time ever in school history, as well as state sectional finalist. Gary was also named Morris County's Coach of the Year. Outstanding fall sports. To give a little uh, report for co-curricular activities, Julie Ryan's robotics team was just recognized as a top 10 global finalist for the 2021 Innovative Challenge season. They also earned the highest score of the day at a recent robotics competition on January 22nd, held at Del Barton. And they'll be hosting the New Jersey Western League Tournament at CHS on February 19th for a sixth year in a row. CHS currently has two staff leaves of absence being covered in-house by fellow department members, stepping up to the plate and covering an additional class. Thanks goes out to Kelly Bomley, Emily Cafaro, Nick DeSantis, Joe Gaba, Betsy Long here tonight of the Science Department, as well as Una Abrams, Nick Agalise, Shannon Faulkner, Tina Lesnowich, and Rachel Ruffner of the English Language Arts Department. To recognize staff committed to higher ed, I want to congratulate Marie Kasoulis, a member of the Social Studies Department, for recently completing her second master's degree. Her first master's was in social studies education from Rutgers. This master's degree was in American history from Pace University. Well done, Murray. Notable staff initiatives, Yar Aaron Yamamoto here tonight, member of the math department, recently wrote and received a CEF grant for math classroom whiteboard desks that he's now using with his math classes along with Meredith Kempson, Kyle Linet, and Laura Sherbo. Okay. Andrea Murphy, part of CHS School Counseling, and Heather Marsh, CHS Student Assistance Counselor, have joined forces to offer once a month Wellness Wednesday events in our rest and relaxation room during lunch. These events are open to all students, and thus far, Wellness Wednesday initiatives have included live music cafes with student performances, and this Wednesday, there'll be an opportunity to interact with therapy dogs. Possible future events include aromatherapy, putty making, mindfulness coloring, and or yoga. Meg, if you could sum up, that'd be fantastic. Sure, last thing, our 2021 Rockstar Teacher of the Year, Julie Camp, will be offering a new course next year, Human Geography. Thank you so much for your time. Excellent, thank you. I'll only ask you, if you'd like all of that captured in the minutes, can you please email that to me? My, my court stenographer uh, skills are a little rusty. <laughs> Nicole Lois, Chatham Township. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Lasusa, for the announcement tonight. Uh, many of us were very hopeful and thankful that we got to hear the good news on the uh, masks uh, coming off in early March, so thank you. Uh, we just had a powerful teaching moment uh, as dictated by the Board of Ed President. Three minutes of forced silence, three minutes of forced action that was uh, not something that was part of the agenda, three minutes of not taking action for the benefit of the Chatham Township constituents. Frankly, I'm speechless by what I witnessed tonight, um, so I would just ask in the future if you plan on doing something like this again, uh, please include it in the agenda. Thank you. Good evening, Bill Heap. Uh, happy February to all. Um, Dr. Lasusa, you and I have been back and forth on this sleep business since before the plague. Uh, I'm still skeptical. I think it's best handled by the family. However, you seem to be uh, very passionate about this. You're also in charge, so I yield to you on this issue. Um, I was disappointed, however, in your presentation uh, because I didn't see anything with regard to what success might look like for you. Uh, 
I hope that you're going to put metrics in place. I, I uh, made a comment on this at the last meeting. This is going to take four, five, six, seven years to play out before we really know how this works. It's one thing to say that students feel more rested. It's another thing to prove it. So uh, if you would, I'd, I'd certainly like you to uh, uh, include some metrics uh, in any future presentations. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Any additional public comments? There's another opportunity after we um, go through the agenda. So I'm going to close the public comments and then answer what I can and then ha ask Dr. Lesusa to ask to address those items that are more related to administrative things. Um, Sharon, thank you very much for your support and for the district cabinet for meeting with Dr. Lesusa on the start times. Uh, the Milton Avenue uh, music and art, I'm going to let Dr. Lesusa talk about the need for combining. Uh, Betsy and Laura, uh, thank you also for your support on the start times. Uh, Megan, thank you for, I don't think people realize how many teachers also coach and do extracurricular clubs and it's always ideal to have a, a teacher with the students for extracurricular rather than bringing in somebody from another district or just somebody that's not an educator. So I don't think folks realize just how many of our staff not only are rock star teachers but then spend hours after helping our students. Uh, Ms. Lois, I think you underestimate the power of silence, so I will not need to announce that in future if I choose not to. I just wanted to give everybody an understanding of what three minutes is really like. I don't think it was time wasted, and if I choose to, I will do it again. But again, I think you underestimate the power of silence. Uh, Mr. Heap, I don't think I've ever heard you yield anything, but, so thank you for yielding to the expertise of the educators in the room. I appreciate it. And I think it's a good idea to, to come up with metrics. So. Um, you know, what does success look like? And again, it's not going to be perfect the first year. It might take seven years to get there, but I think it's a good idea to track metrics and report back maybe, you know, whether it's quarterly or, or semi-annually. Um, so thank you for that suggestion. And Mike, I'm going to kick it back to you on the Milton Avenue um, combination of the art and music. Sure. Well, first off, I apologize if I didn't uh, communicate about that. That's something that I could have included in one of the many letters I've written to parents, but I didn't. Um, preschool, just so we're clear, uh, preschool is, it's mandated that we provide preschool for students who qualify for preschool. So I'm talking specifically about three and four year olds who are diagnosed with a disability that then leads to an IEP and uh, the, you know, preschool services in district. Uh, so when we have students who um, end up being identified or move into town or come to us one way or the other as in need of services at the age of three or four, we don't have a choice, but we have to provide them. It would be like if we all of a sudden had 50 uh, students register for first grade tomorrow, we don't get the, we don't have a choice to say, well, it's February, we're going to pick you up next year. They have to be serviced in district. They qualify given their age for uh, a public education. So um, this year, what we have faced coming out of the pandemic that, that I personally didn't anticipate was that we'd have a much, um, a, a significant increase in preschoolers qualifying for services for one reason or another. It might be because they haven't been in, um, you know, childcare or, or private school settings and they hadn't been identified yet. It might be that, uh, the pandemic impacted students in terms of just their, their typical development, uh, but we've had more preschool students uh, come on board with us as this year has worn on. That necessitated a classroom at Milton Avenue School, and right now we currently house all preschool programs at Milton Ave. There's a playground there that uh, is appropriate for very young children. There are other services in place, including child study team and uh, related service providers, so uh, that's why we have, we needed to take a room and utilize it for preschool. We do that all the time in all of our schools. We repurpose rooms on a regular basis, depending on what the needs are and the programs that we have to provide students. Um, the, the other kinds of issues about Milton Avenue School, the students at Milton Avenue School get the same amount of library time as the students at Washington Avenue School and the students at Southern Boulevard School. We have two librarians that oversee, that split between all three buildings. We just brought on board a new librarian to replace one who retired. 
Uh, the feedback has been he's been doing a terrific job. He's a longtime teacher in the district, had worked at Southern Boulevard School. Uh, what we're doing in library is the same thing that we're doing in music and art, which is that we're sharing staff across the schools because the enrollment has gone down so much that we have fewer sections than we used to have. Uh, that kind of sharing will continue. Uh, as we spoke at, you know, at length last year, and I'm, I'll be doing more of this in the coming months when we talk about budget, um, our enrollment has, de has declined. It's continuing to, to decline now as we move through the grade levels. The high school is the last building that is still pretty much at uh, a plateau. It's down a little bit, but not as much as the middle school or Lafayette. Those two buildings will continue to decline. Um, and at the K-3 level, we're seeing a leveling off. Actually, we're just finishing enrollment, our first round of enrollment now. Uh, it looks like kindergarten is going to be up about 10% year over year from where we were last year. And uh, first grade is probably about the same, but I'll have more information on that at the end of this month. Uh, and then as we get into budget season, I'll be doing more uh, detailed presentations about what our enrollment looks like and where we're losing staff, consolidating positions, and so forth. Right, which we talked about at length. That's just the byproduct of a declining enrollment. We, staff has to be scheduled at an optimal level. Not overstaffed, not understaffed, but optimal, and that's not always foreseeable, but our enrollment is going down. But my question is on the preschool. I know you don't have a crystal ball. You don't know who's going to move into town. You don't know the needs of the students moving into town. But knowing what you know now, is there, do you anticipate needing to redistrict and shifting people, um, you know, some students from Milton to Washington or Washington to Milton to, to free up classrooms for either art or music or, or whatever? That's a conversation that we're having right now, actually. Uh, and we have staffing meetings scheduled. We always schedule staffing meetings at this time of the year once we, we kind of hit the tail end of registration uh, because we have a feel for how many students we will have in first grade, second grade, third grade, and then kindergarten. Uh, and then we meet with all the building principals to kind of project out uh, where we're losing staff for next year and uh, whether or not we need to shift programs around. So. Um, because of the way we have our program set up right now, uh, if we were to move a program out of Milton, it would be either preschool, but then we're, we're splitting resources and we reduce efficiency when we do that, or we would move a, one of our self-contained uh, special education programs from Milton to one of the other buildings. Um, so we're, we're talking that through now, and uh, certainly we'll have more information to share as we get a little further into the into the year. Okay, I mean that's something that's a big ticket item that folks need to know about if we need to do some sort of shifting, and we also have to remember we mention it all the time that there's development going on in the district. So Southern, who has Southern's obviously the the larger of the three K to threes that have 381 students. Uh, there's a development going on. I think it's called Arbor Green. It used to be the skate park. That could that's going to those students will likely go to Southern. Um, we have development in the borough as well. That is scheduled currently to go to Washington. So there's going to be some shifting. And it might not just be a one and done. You know, people may need to realize that it's going to be a fluid situation in order to free up, you know, to have a dedicated art room and music room at Milton. There may have to be some redistricting. That's the trade-off. Um, so let's try and just have these dialogues, you know, during board meetings and as transparent as possible. Maybe you can add things like that in one of your brief letters to the parents that this is on the horizon. Um, so again, it's a, it's a trade-off. We have so many classrooms. We have to educate whoever moves into town, and we'll do the best we can with the physical space that we have. Preschoolers Chris, are bust. Yes, that was the question. Are preschoolers bust? Yes, they're bust. Oh, bust. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? No. Excellent. Great. Okay, great. We have another opportunity at the end, so we're going to move on to the regular agenda. Uh, these are posted on Friday, so we should be able to go through these fairly quickly. Um, action items. I'm sorry, the first item is personnel. Ms. Ciccarelli? Uh, yes, I'd like to move action items A1 to A19 on the regular agenda for vote. Thank you. No. No. Uh, that should be 21, 20, I mean 21, 22, thank you. Great. Um, I second. Great. Any additional questions or comments on any of the personnel items? 
We're happy to welcome Aaron Yamamoto into the leadership team. He's replacing Stacy Winters, who um, resigned for personal reasons. Uh, and Aaron's been a teacher, coach at Chatham High School for four years now. Um, he was terrific in the, throughout the interview process, and we look forward to having him on board. Excellent. Aaron, do you mind uh, just giving a wave so folks know that you're in the audience? I'm sure some of you thought he was a student, but he's actually a supervisor. <laughs> oh, was that me that made that mistake? Excellent. Um, very good. Thank you, Aaron. Welcome aboard. Welcome. Again, don't, um, don't be shy if you need to leave. I know you're in the 15th hour of your day, so we won't hold it against you. You have the job. So if you sneak out the back, we won't even notice. If there's no additional questions, Peter, would you mind? Sure. Agenda items A1 through A19 with A12 uh, corrected. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Del Sandro? Yes. Mr. Gilfillan? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Ms. Ross? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items passed 9 0. Excellent. Uh, over to you, Matt, for finance and facilities. Yes, we'll like to move action item B1 of 23 on your regular agenda. Second. And just one, thank you, uh, the acceptance from our CMS principal of Box Top for Education, December, $154. We always like those little things. All right, roll that up. Does anybody have any questions for Matt? Um, actually, Matt, on the finance stuff, when does budget, uh, is the budget going to start being presented? I know the committee will meet. Well, it's the mic on here is the, actually the budget developed. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat? Um, we'll be discussing the budget at the March, uh, March 21st meeting, which will be the preliminary uh, approval. Okay. And uh, Mike, will, Mike and I will be doing it with the Finance Committee uh, starting the March meeting. Okay, very good. And we're going to do a similar, um, you know, those, the bars where we can say the various percentage increases and what we're getting for it and what we're giving up if we don't go that direction. Okay, great March meeting. Bradley, did you have a question? Nope. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, any other additional questions or comments for finance? Nope. nope. Okay, Peter? Agenda items B1 through B23. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Del Sandro? Yes. Mr. Gilfillan? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Ms. Ross? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items passed 9 0. Excellent, thank you. Ms. Clark for curriculum. Um, I move curriculum items C1 and 2 on the regular agenda, and there can be no discussion. Okay, so we can't do, ask too many questions on those. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? There you go, Peter. Duly noted C1 and 2 passed 9-0. Mr. Ryan, over to you for policy. This is probably going to be the lightest policy for a while for you. <laughs> I'd like to move action item D1 on the regular agenda for a vote. Second. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Ryan on the policy? Mr. Ryan, is it your anticipation that at the next meeting or at, at the first opportunity, we will be doing um, first, second, and acceptance of some of the policies, particularly the mask one yes. I'm referring to? Yes, the mask one will be first, second, and third. First, second, and final. Okay, thanks. So just to remind folks, sometimes we have to expedite and not do it in successive meetings. So if we need to expedite a policy like removing the masks, we'll do it all at the next meeting. Okay, yes. great. Fantastic. And, and this one on the agenda, Ms. Weber, is this will be the mask policy. Um, the adjustment now is to reflect that we're, we've moved towards the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia guidelines when it right. comes to um, quarantining. We've had just a flurry of updates from the NJDOH in the month of January, and it you know, has been difficult to keep pace with how many revisions we have been receiving. So this policy is just the first pass to um, you know, kind of move towards a, a, an approach where we're quarantining only symptomatic students as opposed to every close contact who was unvaccinated. Uh, and so we'll have to readjust this again based on the information today from Governor Murphy, and then we'll try to get it completely ready for March 7th so that it right. takes care of all the, all the issues that we're dealing with. Okay. And, and just to reiterate, Mike Ryan and Mike Wasusa are not waiting 
for the formality of a policy to implement change that will positively impact students in this instance. You implemented the change and now you're, we're updating the policy. So we're not going to hold off just, you know, where we, where we can expedite it. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you. Again, good luck, Mr. Ryan, for the next few weeks. Um, all those in favor of D1? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Excellent. Duly noted, D1 passes 9-0. Uh, any new items for board business? Is there a calendar update, Mike, coming our way? Uh, I didn't get to that this time round, but we can put it in the hopper. Okay, put that in the hopper just so folks can plan accordingly. And then, okay, great, no additional board? Oh, Matt, did you have something? No, very good. Okay, we have our second opportunity for public commentary. Again, if you wouldn't mind, um, when you go up to the mic, just introduce yourself. Unless you need no introduction, like Mr. Heap. Is this to get your steps in that you sit this far away from the mic? It was crowded in the middle. I didn't, I, <laughs> what can I tell you? I need to sit in the front row so I can stretch my legs out. Uh, I'd like to tell you that I did take advantage of the three-minute moment of silence by doing some reading. And uh, I'd like to report on that if I could. So uh, with a little bit of humor, I guess, let's wander over to the corner and uh, to the uh, filing cabinet and pull open the drawer, pull out the file that says California, subheading the state where anything is possible. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reports on a town called Woodside, California, which is in Silicon Valley. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it probably could lay claim to the wealthiest town in the United States. Palo Alto is uh, loud money, Woodside is quiet money. Uh, think uh, Harding Township on steroids. Luminaries like Steve Jobs used to live there, Larry Ellison lives there now, uh, and uh, John Doerr, and even a geriatric rocker who was lately in the news, Neil Young, and I'd really like to get his take on this. So here goes. Uh, they take their progressive politics very seriously, but they do draw the line at affordable housing. And the town mothers and fathers, in an attempt to sidestep their obligation, declared the entire town a sanctuary for mountain lions, AKA cougars. Do you see where I'm going with this? Uh, the state attorney general was not impressed. Uh, lawsuits are flying, but I think it's something we should closely watch because if they can do it, well, we are a sanctuary for cougars, aren't we? Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to let it go. And I just want, again, I have to remind folks that it's public commentary and we don't get to dictate what folks talk about. So thank you, Mr. Heap, for the Woodside lesson. I appreciate that. Uh, Vanessa Yuri, uh, thank you for your time and your response about the Milton classrooms. I really appreciate the thoughtful conversation. While I'm here, I thought I'd just add a few quick questions impromptu. Um, for example, would it be possible at, for the district to post, whether it's on an intranet site or externally, or you know, I'm not sure the reasons why we wouldn't do this, but so that parents can understand what are the current enrollments, um, what are the projected enrollments? I mean, the most recent information I could find was from 2017, 2018 on the website. So I just think, if you're asking us to anticipate that you know classrooms may need to shift and um, redistricting may need to happen, I just think as a parent, I want to just be part of that conversation and just understand so, with my own eyes, um, so I can make a good decision for my kids. And I, I think, you know, when you pick up your kids on the blacktop, this is the topic of conversation: is you know what's going on, what are they doing, why are they doing that, and. Um, just think a little bit more transparency would help parents understand why certain things are being done, myself included. Um, you know, another concern I have is just, you know, I, I understand that the district is trying to have a comparable experience, but in the last three years, my children at Milton Avenue School have seen the reduction of a librarian. Now their art classroom is being downsized. Um, obviously it was pandemic time, so I know things were Crazy, but I just feel like as we're coming out of that, if we can get a little bit of a direction and vision on, you know, our, I mean, potentially it could be a, you know, 
maybe you're trying to reduce arcs. I, I don't think that's the case, but it just, that's what it can feel like to you know, our kids who don't have a lot of extracurriculars right now. So, um, and then with respect to the CHIP classroom itself, I understand that there's requirements for those who are qualified, um, but my understanding is that even if you go on the website right now, it looks like the school district is soliciting applications for um, further students to enroll in CHIP right now. And my personal experience is that there are students in the CHIP program who don't qualify because I think they are trying to have seats in the classroom for something that they're required to do. So now there's an additional classroom being added to Milton, um, and I don't know that it's necessarily required if it could be consolidated. So um, just looking for additional information as we move forward um, so that parents can follow along with why certain things have to be done and if we can make an assessment for ourselves. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Any additional comments? No? Nope. Okay, great. We're going to close the second public commentary. So would, we do have an executive session. So thank you for those suggestions. I appreciate it. Again, Mr. Heap, thanks for enlightening us on the mountain lions. Um, we, we'll talk about the enrollment numbers. Um, we couldn't, we can't get too granular because some of it's a security concern, but certainly at a high level. Like, for example, last year or the year before, the graduating class was like three, I was looking it up, it was like 360, and our current first graders are 180. When you lose 180 students, there has to be some reduction in staff. We can't keep staff on that's not, you know, that has blank, just three or four blank sections. So it is a balancing act, but I think there's some merit to, I mean, we talk about it all the time, but maybe there's an opportunity to post it on the website as well. Um, I don't know if Dr. Lususa wanted to, I'm certainly not touching the chip, chip applications that we're soliciting. Um, you know, we have to educate those kids that are in the district, and I'm certainly well underqualified as a programmer to qualify, to talk about somebody's qualifications or not. Nathan? Go. So with demographics and enrollment, uh, we did have the big demographic report in 2018, the fall of 2018. That's posted on our website. I have put up slides in the past just dedicated to enrollment. To be honest with you, the last couple of years, I think most of that is embedded in other presentations, uh, like budget presentations or other things where there's a slide or two slides, you know, nine and ten out of a 25-slide presentation. Um, but we can put that more front and center, and I certainly will be talking about that in the back half of this year. Uh, the way the preschool works is we there is a segment of students who qualify for preschool. However, those, part of the program for, for many of those students involves time interacting with typically developing peers. So the students need to have interaction and time during the day with students who don't qualify for preschool. So in some districts that offer universal preschool, that's very easily accomplished. In districts like ours where we don't offer universal preschool, we we fill the slots that we have in order to provide the students who qualify with the experience they need with tuition students. So that's kind of how the preschool runs, you know, big picture. Um, and right now, I mean, on this agenda, I believe we set the tuition rate for next year uh, for students who would attend preschool on a tuition basis and not on a qualifying basis. Uh, so it gets a little tricky. And of course, right now, for any of the, the students who were there on a tuition basis this year, we wouldn't necessarily boot them out. You know, we've told them you have a slot this year for preschool. Now that we have a bunch of additional students who we have to service, we wouldn't, you know, it's not ideal to tell a family, even though you had a commitment from us for the year, now we're gonna throw you out. And then it compromises what we can provide the students who do qualify. So it's a little bit complicated. In terms of like the, the use of facilities, we've had, Many years at Washington Avenue School, music was done on the stage. There was no classroom for music because space was so tight there. We've had music done in the basement uh, where the cafeteria is at Southern Boulevard School because we didn't have enough classrooms upstairs. So we shift around all the time. 
Um, I think it's, a, 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 it's, it's an interesting point that I don't think about when the perception could be that we're trying to reduce the, you know, the value of music, let's say, or, or the arts, which of course we're not trying to do. Uh, it's simply a matter of space and where we can put certain programs when we need classrooms for typical homeroom um, sections and you know, homeroom teachers. Uh, so we can you know, look into doing better on a number of those fronts. Okay, um, Ann just mentioned that the CHIP program is a lottery. If you get more applicants than slots, does it, is it a lottery or is it a first come first serve? It's usually been a lot. Usually we have more demand than we can meet. Okay. Yes, and to reiterate, reiterate, there is nowhere in our plan to eliminate any of those extra activities. Some of our students, like especially at the higher grades, I mean the art programs are phenomenal um, here in our district across the board and some of our students come to school because of the art class. They're not here because they want to learn about quadratic equations. They're here for art. They're here for music. They're here for performing arts. So to answer your question, is it, is it the goal to get rid of those? Absolutely not. Those are lifelong skills. Those help with their mental health. Absolutely not. They have a, the program's fabulous. Right. Just is. Excellent. Um, does anybody else have any other comments or question on any of that? We do have a brief executive session. Action may be taken. Yes. Um, most likely will be taken. Um, so we're just going to meet in the room. Too long. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. I appreciate your time. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you for the dialogue. We have some good takeaways. So thank you.